And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. To help us to truly understand the father's love, let's look at it from two points of view. First, the prodigal son and the decisions that he had made, and then the response of the father. The prodigal son, he, first of all, he spent or wasted all that he had. It says that he had everything going his way. He had everything that he needed. He had all of, he had given, been given his money from his father. He was prepared. He was going out. But what does it say that he did with his money? Well, it says that he, he took it and journeyed to a far country, and then he just wasted it. He could have done as he wished. He could have lived as if there was no tomorrow, but tomorrow always comes. And he had soon wasted all that he had. His portion of his goods, that is, everything that he had, was his share of the inheritance. What, he's, what his father had inherited, what his father had accumulated in his lifetime, all that there was... He had requested his part of the inheritance. The son had not earned it. He had not worked for it. He was receiving it strictly because he was the son. But then what is it that he did with it? He wasted it. Selfishly, frivolously. The word used in the ESV there is he squandered it on reckless... He squandered his property in reckless living. He just wasted every single thing that he had. But not only did he just ruin what he had at that moment, there was a famine that came. And with that famine, his future began to deteriorate quickly. He had all that he needed to start out in life from this inheritance he had requested from his father. He could have bought tools for a trade or land to use for property, for an investment to, to produce what he needed. But all of a sudden, he had thrown all of that away. All that he had thought about was the thrill of the moment. But then it also says that in verse 16, he had completely ruined his reputation. The only job that he could get was to feed the pigs. And it says that he was wanting to have food. He wished he could have it, but all that he had, no one would give him anything. No one would give him anything else. The only job that he could get was feeding pigs. Think if you saw a strong, sprightly young man that came around in a, a time period that's based around agriculture. There's lots of manual labor jobs to be done, even if it was in a famine. There's always manual labor that needs to be done. Certainly you could have someone that would come on and she'd say, I can't give you anything but a meal once a day. But what did he get? Feed the pigs. Slop the hogs. If you've ever been around pigs, they are not very... Pleasant animals, they do not smell very good. In Virginia, we had some friends that always kind of made me chuckle. Their last name was Penley, and they had pens and pens of hogs, and they smelled like hogs all the time. Their house smelled like it. They smelled like it, and it was just the way that it always was. And recently, in the last couple years, I think it was three years ago, maybe it was, maybe it was two, we had an opportunity when we went up to Virginia that they were their sons um, were doing some hog slaughtering, and they were, going to, they were doing some different things, and so I was able to go up there and help out with some of that for a very short period of time. But even though I wasn't the one touching and doing all of the work with skinning the hogs and all the things that were going on, just being around there for most of a day, I began to smell like a pig, and it was not a very pleasant experience. But if you think about this young man who could have had the opportunity to do so much with his life, he completely wasted it and threw it all away. And now, even if he really wanted to get a job that would be working with other people, he's going to have trouble because he's going to be having to take some really good baths. Well, not to the same degree as a skunk. He just is completely smelly. He has wasted all that he had. He's ruined his reputation. He's ruined his future. No one saw him as a person with a potential. No one saw him as a person of character. 
No one saw him as someone that they wanted. And then he says that he came to himself and he realized that he had also bankrupted his soul as it was. Not only had he emptied his pockets of all that he had, he had also emptied his soul of all that there was that was right or good that he may have been taught. He had forsaken God. He had forsaken all that was right. He was financially, morally, and spiritually bankrupt. He had nothing. It says he had wasted all that he had and all that had been given to him. He lost everything but his life. And that was next. And then at this moment, we see a change come over the young man. As he could only find a job feeding hogs. It says in verse 17, he came to himself. It doesn't mean that he was crazy and then all of a sudden he received consciousness but it's one of those moments where he's sitting there and he's thinking and then all of a sudden the light bulb turns on in his mind and he realizes a very unfortunate fact that he was nothing he had nothing he came to himself and realized oh wow i have sinned against god i've sinned against my father he begins to think and prepares a speech to share in verse 18, he says, you know, I need to get up and I need to go tell my father and tell him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. He says, you know, I realize that I have done such a horrible thing. I'm not even worthy to be a son in verse 19. He says, treat me as one of your servants. He thought, you know, this is pretty bad feeding hogs, but even my servants, even the servants at my father's house received better than this. Maybe I could go back and maybe, maybe I could repay my father and I could earn back a place just to stay in his house, to stay in, in the home in which I grew up. He's thinking, he's, he's processing all of this. And one thing that's interesting to note is he plans to have to convince his father. He realizes that he has done some stupid, stupid things. And he realizes that maybe his father won't want him back. Maybe he's going to have to persuade his father, maybe to, to bargain and to, to give up a little and say, you know, maybe I won't even stay in the house. Maybe I could just stay in the barn, but if you'd feed me, I'd still be doing better than I am here. He anticipated convincing his father, realizing that he doesn't deserve or even expect to be taken back into his father's household. But he begins to make that journey home. It says that he went off to a far country, you can use your imagination to determine how far that is. But he was some distance away, not anywhere in the immediate area. He doesn't deserve to be taken back. But as he begins to get closer and closer, he looks out, and when he nears home, he sees his father afar off. And his father sees him. And his father does something. His father begins to run. We all have heard this story probably since we were young, hearing the story of what happens to the father. He runs, he runs. But can you imagine just for a moment if you don't know the end of the story and you see this father running towards this son that has taken half of his inheritance, left, ruined the family name, wasted all that he had, and he smells like a pig and he's coming back home. And what does he do when he sees his father running? Do you think he jumps for joy and says, oh, yay, my father's coming? No, he, he begins to shake or maybe trepidation and fear overwhelms him and says, oh, is he going to tell me I have to leave? Is he going to turn me away? Is he going to push me back? Is he coming to beat me? Is he coming to punish me? What is he coming to do? And the son that doesn't know what his future holds. So if we pause for a moment, and we go back and let's look at everything from the father's side of view. Let's look at what's been happening with the father. We see the father is longing and desiring for his wayward son. He's looking for his son. It says in verse 20 that his father saw him while he was still a long ways off. Though his son had rebelled, had taken half of the inheritance and left while he's still alive, his father still desired for him to be at home. He recognized and realized that his home was incomplete without his son. He refused to accept the fact that he was gone forever. We have to realize that quite a period of time had to have passed because even if they are the most, that, that son was the most frivolous spender that there ever was, we would have to imagine that it 
that it lasted for at least a couple weeks, maybe a month or so, and then he obtained a job after that. He was, this is a significant period of time. This isn't simply a day or two or three or four. This was a period of time that he had been gone. And yet, his father had refused to give up on him. In the book of Genesis, we see God calling out to Adam and Eve, saying, where are you? In the same way this father was seeking and looking for his son. No matter what you've done, where you have been, he is looking for you. He's not going to force you and tie you up and drag you into his family, but he wants you to come back into the family. In the same way that the father is similar to God, we can also see the father clearly loved his son. When he runs to his son, the first thing that we we see him talking, and when he begins to communicate with his son, he doesn't condemn him, he doesn't punish him, He's not telling him all the things that he did wrong. But the first thing that happens is he ran and embraced him and kissed him. and gives him a great big old hug. The father was moved with compassion. He cared about his son's needs and conditions. He could see very clearly from the way that his son was returning that he did not have what he left with. The son lost everything, every single thing, except for his father's love. His father did not just feel sorry for him, but his father truly loved him. And God sees us as we are, and yet he is compassionate. God accepts all that come to him. You may lose everything, but you will never lose God's love. We see in verses 21 and 22 that his son begins in with his prearranged speech. Verses 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father says to his servants, he interrupts his apology and his speech, and he took him as he was. He calls for the best robe, the family ring, new shoes. He announces that there's going to be a banquet, a big celebration. The father gave unconditional forgiveness. He didn't have to wait until he looked like he had before. He didn't make him pay back what was wasted. He didn't make him a second-rate member of the family. He didn't put him on probation or sneak him in the back of the house saying, Oh, you're welcome. Just come in the servant's entrance. No. The past was forgiven. He does not receive another inheritance. As it says clearly as we go on through the rest of the, the story, he didn't receive his inheritance again. He didn't get all that extra stuff all over again, but he was completely forgiven. You don't have to change your past or yourself to be forgiven by God. God will accept you as you are if you will come. He doesn't look at what you are. He looks at what you can be. The father blessed his sons with his son with gifts, a robe, a ring, shoes, a feast, Maybe you could compare this to the robe of salvation, the, the ring of the father that was given as a signet, as something that identifies him as belonging to that family. He could ask in the father's name in the same way that as Christians we can ask in Christ's name. The shoes show sonship because maybe many of the servants would have been barefooted. But then that banquet, the food, the ultimate reason why he came was so that he might have food. The father gave so much more to the son than he ever expected. But is that not the way that God treats us? He gives us the salvation that we need, but oh, he gives us so much more. The blessings that he gives us of his love, his grace, his compassion. Christ said, I'm sending a comforter, one that will guide you, one that will instruct you, that will be with you, that will help you every step along the way. The father in verse 24 calls him his son. He was renewed as his son and with all the blessings and privileges of that possession, position, his son was back where he belonged. And then in 20, verse 24, he celebrated his son's return. The joy and enthusiasm shows the father's heart. He's not begrudgingly allowing his son to come home. 
His love is seen in every word and deed. And God loves us even when we don't deserve it. God loves you. He cares about you. He knows what's happened in the past, but he knows what you can become. He knows how much he loves you. He values you, you to such the extent that he sent his only son that he would die so that you and I might enter into a relationship with him so that we could truly know the love of the Father. And it's that love that he gives each one of us he doesn't expect us to continue to wallow in the filth of the pig pen. When we come home, we have a new robe, we have a new name, a new family that we are a part of. He doesn't expect us to return to that and continue to do as we have done, but he gives us a new life in Christ. He transforms us at one instantaneous moment. We go from being an outsider to being adopted into his family, his heavenly family. God loves you more than you ever realize. If you are watching, if you are away from the Father, He is watching for you. And the beautiful thing about this story is that even while the Son is afar off, the Father runs to Him as He has been standing, waiting, watching. And God says the same thing. He says, if you will draw nigh to Him... He will draw nigh to you. That means if you will get close to Him, if you will begin to approach Him, He will come to you. If you will seek Him, He will be found. If you realize your need are remorseful or sorry or repenting for the past, you can come home to the Father. And with an embrace of forgiveness, He will make you a part of the family of God. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. Though we can't explain it, though we can't fully understand it, God loves us. This excitement, this joy that each one of us can experience as Christians isn't something that should be kept to ourselves. This is something that is truly a miraculous thing. This love that fills us, that should be overflowing and bubbling around us is what we should be sharing with the world around us. Whether we are a father as we are to be instructing our children or a mother that is teaching their ch young children is, uh, every step along the way, it is our responsibility to share the love of God in the world around us. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. Just come to him and will you say, Father, I'm coming home.